Father, as we approach your throne this morning, we do so through the precious and powerful blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We approach you, Lord, not because we bring to you good things to earn your favor or to catch your attention, but because in Christ we are fully accepted and loved and have his full favor already upon us. We thank you for this grace that you have given to us in which to stand. We pray this morning that you, as we bow our knees before you, would, according to the riches of your glory, grant that we would be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner beings. We pray that Christ would dwell richly in our hearts through faith, that we would be rooted and grounded in love, and that you would give us strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you would fill us with all of your fullness. We claim and expect this, not because we claim and expect it, but because of your grace upon us, O God. We lift to you ourselves this morning, Lord, in our need. You're familiar uh, with great detail, um, with all of the details of our lives. And so, God, we pray that you would be our healer. Many bodies, Lord, have undergone surgery, have undergone pain, and are in the middle of that. Lord, would you bring your healing to those in our body in those situations? We pray for our souls, Lord, that you would make them whole by your great power. We pray for our world, O God. We pray for your peace, and we pray for your justice, even as we pray for your mercy and your salvation for all peoples. We think especially, Lord, of the conflict right now in the Holy Land, and we ask, O oh God, for your hand of deliverance, and especially that you would magnify Jesus in the hearts of those involved. Lord, we pray that you would turn our attentions now to you and your word, that you would cause it to come alive in our hearts, that as we look at this idea of spiritual maturity, that you would Fix our focus on your goal for us. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, hopefully you have your copy of the uh, booklet that we have produced for the sermon series. And if you turn to the section there for October the 22nd entitled Spiritual Maturity, we will get started there if you want to open your Bible to the first passage we'll be looking at together, we'll be at Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. Now, if you watch the news these days, or listen to the news these days, or read it, and I don't necessarily recommend that, but if you do, <laughs> you will oftentimes find yourself, if you're like me, walking away, scratching your head, saying, people just don't know what it means to be human anymore? Or where are all the adults in our country, <laughs> right? Where are the grown-ups? Without clarity on what we were created to be, people's lives are distorting in our culture into confusing and self-destructive directions, and our culture is breaking down. It's apparent that in our culture, um, this is happening, but it can happen in the church as well. The church herself has suffered with difficulty in understanding who we are and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And because we don't know what it means to be a grown-up follower of Jesus, churches are breaking down as well. It may be that you have never considered spiritual maturity to the point that you have gained clarity on what it is. Now, we know the simple answers clearly, right? That conformity, uh, that spiritual maturity is conformity to the image of Jesus, that it is growing up. But there's an analog between growing up as a human and growing up spiritually. When you're a boy, you don't just naturally know what it means to be a man, 
When you're a girl, you don't know naturally what it means to be a woman. You need to be instructed and raised up in this, and it needs to be defined for you so you know what that really is. It's not automatic. It's not entirely obvious. And so we can say, what does it mean to be an adult? And an answer might be in general form, it means to be 18 years or older. It means to be a grown-up, right? So we have the big category, but what do those things mean? What is adulthood? What is spiritual maturity in specific? The church runs the same risk if we don't clearly define it, understand it, know where our goal is, that we're sort of like doing ministry, like throwing jello against a wall and just hoping something sticks, how something happens out of this, sort of magically. And some of our mistaken answers in the church have wreaked a whole lot of damage and harvested a poison crop. One definition of maturity that falls short is that believing what is right means that I'm mature, may may even make me better than someone else. This definition of maturity leads to self-righteous people who are judgmental and who are destructively critical because this definition of love doesn't include the animation of compelling, the definition of maturity doesn't include the compelling nature of love. And so it'll lead to judgmentalism and abusive behavior. A close cousin is legalism, where righteousness is obeying a list of rules, whether it's the don'ts or the do's, and as long as I do that, then I am mature. But this leads to a soulless distortion of maturity that is lacking grace and vibrancy and joy and love. Another distortion of maturity, or maybe a substitute for maturity, is people-pleasing. This is hypocrisy in its most pleasing Midwest-friendly form. It's living for the approval of others. And it's confusing because it seems like it's meeting the need that we have, a craving for love and approval from other people, But because you can't please everyone all the time, it actually leads us into a lot of conflictedness and anxiety over over our state of being loved. It also turns you into a person who is taking from others, even as you purport to be giving from them. I'm seeking your approval, and I'm I'm extracting that from you instead of coming to you for your good uh, alone. That's the opposite of love, right? There's another one. We could go on with the list. There are millions of distortions, right? Ways to not do it right. But one uh, further that bears mentioning is I would say emotional experience in the church. Could be a worship moment. It could be um, an ecstatic experience. And it feels like a, a feels like maturity, Maybe it is a real moment with God, but it feels like maturity or like you've arrived. But it could be likened, in this case, to physical intimacy before marriage. It's like some of the feels of love without the substance of it, the actual commitment and life behind it. Jesus' words seem to fit here. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. If we can get clarity here, if we can have a a solid understanding and vision of where we are headed, then we have the potential to invest in ways that are faithful and fruitful, that help produce spiritually mighty people. And to aid in that clarity, I want to forecast where we're going this morning with the definition. The big idea of spiritual maturity is that a spiritual mature person is equipped and engaged in the mission of Jesus with the same motives that he has. That's our goal. Lots of ways to fall short, but God is calling us to be equipped and engaged people in the mission of Jesus who are driven by his same motives. Now that's the end, and here's the practice. The practice is that we are established in obedience, that we are equipped for growth, And we are examples of Christ. So let's look first at being established. Mature disciples are established in obedience. Maturity is about 
both being and doing in our obedience. A mature Christian does the will of God. Now, this sounds obvious, right? But this is what Jesus teaches us. Now, we have definitions of what it means to be a Christian, right? I believe in God or I've made a profession of faith. These are things that hopefully are the beginning of a walk with Christ. But maturity looks like taking the words of Jesus and put them in, putting them into action. Jesus told us that was the goal in Matthew 28, 20. Look there in your Bible. Jesus has told us to make disciples and then he gives us the two things to do. Baptizing them and then in verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Every follower of Christ, as we've looked at in this sermon series, is a person who is called to follow after Jesus. And in following after Jesus, to deny themselves daily and take up their cross and walk after him. That's for anyone who would come after Jesus. This speaks of a sufficient and growing conviction that is born of faith that what Jesus says, I must obey. Disciples learn to observe all that he has commanded. And that's why it's so central for us to be in the word of God listening to those commands and to be alive through the Holy Spirit in the new birth so that we can grow into Maturity, the word of God is to a mathematician what his formulas are, or to a mechanic what his schematic is, or to a cook what his ingredients are, or like all of us, it is to us, our bodies, it is to our, the, the word of God is to our souls what food is to our bodies. It's our nourishment, it's our life. And so Paul wrote to Timothy and here's Timothy trying to be faithful in ministry, this young man serving in the church. And he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. Continue in it. You don't move on from it. Knowing from whom you learned it and how from a childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. There's the beginning. Salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, next verse. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable or useful or effective for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. In other words, that's the life lived out based upon the truth of God. That the man of God or the woman of God may be complete. That's maturity brought to its final end, brought to its goal, maturity, equipped for every good work. Now we're going to look at the equipping in just a few moments, and the Word of God is key both for completing us and equipping us. This goal of righteousness. Christians today sometimes want Christianity to be done for us, right? We want to come to church, and we want to have our feelings stirred up to make me want to do something. And if that feeling doesn't come because the music just wasn't what I was looking for, or the sermon just didn't have that, that extra touch to it, right? That somehow God failed, the Word of God failed, church failed me. But brother and sister, if you are the hungry one, step up to the table and eat for yourself. Take in the Word of God. Welcome it, cherish it, and live it out. No one can read the Bible for you. No human can make you want to obey it. But if you are to grow into a person who has conviction about the truth, and that conviction leads you to the necessity to obey it, it will be because you have taken in the word of God. And that obedience will lead you to a life of love. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we examined Ephesians 4, and we talked about the danger of being spiritual children. This is what this is talking about. This is saying we grow up in being established in the basic truths of the gospel, and those flesh themselves out into the advanced life of a Christian, the mature life of a Christian. There, those babies were being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. When something new came along, they said, yeah, that sounds good. And they kept going. But where there is certainty and conviction about the basic truths of the gospel, like the deity of Christ and the deadliness of sin, 
the power of grace through faith in salvation, the truthfulness of God's word, God's character and his triune nature, the historical reality of the virgin birth and the vicarious death of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus that we declare each month in our recitation of the Apostles' Creed. These things constitute the core of our convictions as people who have committed ourselves to Jesus and have joined together in membership around those truths at World Gospel Church. If you want to dig a little bit deeper into what some of those convictions are, go to our website, go to the About Us part, and click through to our statement of faith and our articles of faith. There's richness there, and there is the substance of the basic truths that we center our lives around and are growing into and out of. World Gospel Church and followers of Jesus more broadly are not living for the approval of the world. We're not living as independent actors who are just trying to get our lives together, but people whose conviction is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only Savior and that He alone possesses the words of life and therefore have struck out with conviction by the grace of God to live lives following Him. So maturity is in the living out of those truths, but maturity is also in the being that God makes us into. A mature Christian is something in his being. He is a person who is inhabited and animated by the love of God, by the love of Jesus. We've looked at that in weeks past, so I'm not going to spend an extensive amount of time here, but a reminder, when Jesus was asked, what are the two greatest commandments? And if we are here to obey the commandments of Jesus as his disciples, right, all of his commandments, the two greatest are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So if this is the ultimate commandment upon which all the other commands depend, if living it is necessary and integral to every other subordinate command, and Jesus has said so, John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. If, if the doing is in the being, then maturity will always produce love. No such thing as maturity without love. It's necessary for obedience. It's the fruit of of spiritual growth shows us that God is eternally and clearly and entirely working to make us relationally healthy people. Isn't that amazing? God is making us relationally healthy people. That's what love is. It's healthy relating to one another, not extracting things from each other. And so the goal isn't just rule following, it's relational. It's being taught by God to love one another. Now, if we were to apply this as, the con as a congregation to say, what does it look like to be a mature congregation or local expression of the body of Christ? Then it would be in these same terms. The question would be, how well do we as a body love each other? Love doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in relationships. So how connected am I personally in relationships in the body of Christ where I am giving myself to others? That's a question. How healthy is World Gospel Church in this? And what are our next steps of obedience to Christ and His command to love? I think, brothers and sisters, we have a great opportunity ahead of us here at World Gospel in building greater community here where this love can work itself out and our connectedness and relationships can grow. A mature disciple is someone, as we have distilled in our, in our book there on your page on the right, is someone who has shown themselves committed to living their life in Christ Jesus as his disciple according to God's word, with love toward God and others, who has a clear understanding and conviction 
of the essentials of the faith. And just like we are progressing from birth until death and growing and, and developing, there is a development in maturity where we are growing up and have grown up and yet we're still growing, right? There's a, there's a threshold where you become mature, but even though you're mature, it's not as though you stop growing. There's always more to learn and more to do. And so a mature disciple is equipped for growth. There's a little bit of depth here in the scripture, actually a lot of depth here in the scripture about what this means and how this requires effort and determination and experience. If you go back to Hebrews 5, which Chris referenced last week, the author of Hebrews chides the readers of the letter by saying in chapter 5, verse 12, that they ought to be teachers by now, but they're not. They had the time, they had the resources before them, and, and yet they were laying all of that fallow and going on about life, and they were having to be retaught the basics over and over again, and they were still sipping on milk like nursing, right, babies. And he tells them that the reason is that they are, in verse 13, unskilled in the word of righteousness. That goes back to what we talked about in taking the word of God and living it out for righteousness, Right? He says in verse 14, the solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. It's discernment and wisdom involved. As they try to live it out, they have to figure it out. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. He says, not going back to the foundation over and over again, but establish your foundation and build from there, from your convictions, from the Word of God. He's telling us that growth is not automatic. Growth is not osmotic. It doesn't just happen to us. It is something that we work out with fear and trembling because of the accountability that we have to God for where we are. And we talked last week, Chris did, about how spiritual growth can vary and is affected by the individual circumstances and experiences in our lives. While we are never what we should be or never what we could be in the sense of perfection, in the sense that we'll have regrets, these things should not hinder us in the least from earnest, passionate, and ambitious pursuit of faithfulness in our calling to Jesus. The point is doing what we can with what we have. And it's not about earning the favor of God or becoming worthy to Jesus. Jesus did all of that for us on the cross. We're favored by him. And we see this playing out in the example of Paul in Philippians chapter 3. Now, everybody would say Paul's a pretty good example of what it looks like to be mature, right? Someone who lived a life based on conviction regardless of what it cost him in self-sacrificial love for people who he'd never met before as he pressed into different places in the world to bring the gospel. But in Philippians chapter 3, he reflects on his own experience of growth and maturity, and he gives us an insight into what it looks like both to grow into maturity and to, to live a life out of maturity. And he says in Philippians 3, verses 12 and following, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. I haven't reached the end of my growth. Listen to what he says. But I press on to make it my own. Because, not to make Christ Jesus my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what is, lies behind and straining forward toward what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. He goes on to say, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Let's take stock of some of those words just for a second that we've encountered in Hebrews 5 and Philippians chapter 3. We've heard the word trained, training our senses for discernment according to the word of God. That's exercise and discipline. 
Hebrews 5 said that they're trained through practice. That's repeated activity that develops itself in fine detail of a skill. It's training and discipline. Hebrews 6, 1 said we go on to maturity. That means that we move rapidly and decisively toward an objective. That's what the Greek word means. And Paul just said in Philippians 3 that we are to press on. We are to move rapidly and decisively toward the objective of maturity. So brothers and sisters in Christ, we were made alive in Jesus and equipped with the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to move forward in the power of God under his favor, to undergo exercise, to, to be disciplined and press on and move rapidly toward maturity. Rooted and built up and established in the faith. There's no secret room where we learn this stuff about Jesus that makes us mature. Maturity is simply taking the basic truths of the gospel and living them out. And maturity requires grace. Requires grace. You may think, hear these things, you think, how in the world am I going to develop godly character from where I am right now? How is it that my heart's going to change from just, just being captivated by a list of do's and don'ts or by the approval of other people to a place where I'm animated by love and filled with wisdom and living solidly these things day by day? You might hear me today and think, well, Ben's just saying, just try harder and do better next time. And next time you have the choice, just do the right thing. But that's not how we grow in the gospel isn't it beautiful that what we were called to in repentance and faith and salvation by grace is the same place that we live for the rest of eternity under God's favor to grow. It's shocking when you realize that God doesn't intend you to grow just by doing better next time. Listen to Titus 2, 11 through 12. It says, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. So what is it that's, that's at work here? It's the grace of God that brings salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. The thing that animates us with energy and discipline and self-control is the grace of God. Now that's counterintuitive and paradoxical. How is it that something like undeserved generosity and renounce, guides us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion? Isn't it grace, we think, that, that makes things just not sort of a big deal? It doesn't really take time to correct things. It just sort of washes over it all and, and ignores it. But no, the Bible tells us the grace of God, his favor toward us teaches us to turn away from ungodliness. Why is that? Because we were saved out of sin, brothers and sisters. That's where we are. Romans 5, 20 through 21 says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. You hear that? The answer to our sin is the abounding grace of God so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Christ our Lord. And there's a reality here, a, an ironclad connection that if we have truly understood and experienced grace, there will be a change in our righteousness. And if we are led into a life of righteousness, it will be because we have been trained by the grace of God. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, if the grace you have received does not help you keep the law, then you have not received grace. Augustine said this on the other side, the law detects sin, grace alone conquers sin. So conquered it for you, isn't it? Not that you came to God with your act together, but that you brought to God your brokenness. And he brought out of that brokenness healing and life. 
Grace never leaves us bound in sin that presses us away from God and works death in us. Grace teaches us that we obey out of the favor of God, loved by Him, under His generous and undeserved blessing. So grace is our power. to be and to do as we grow into Christ. So a mature disciple is one who is properly equipped for continuing to grow in the faith and greater and greater fruitfulness. Finally, and this is an aspect of maturity that I think is often lost in the church because we sometimes lose the relational nature of what God's doing in the gospel and in the local body of Christ, that a mature disciple is one who is established for obedience and equipped for growth, who can serve as an example for others. This is the goal that we're headed toward, brothers and sisters in Christ. Like Jesus with his disciples, Jesus intends us to make people in his image who serve as living examples of him. If you read through the book of 1 Corinthians, which I've done recently um, this week, and I was really challenged and, and blessed by it, but it was, it, was, it was beautiful to see again the tenderness and the firmness with which the apostle addresses this body of believers, but, but the delusion that they were living under, the, the, the Corinthians thought they were mature. The Corinthians thought they were grown up, and yet Paul it sort of processes through where they're at and evaluates them and says, you're jealous and fighting with each other. <laughs> you are sexually immoral and you are arrogant about it. You are gifted by the Spirit of God and yet you think that makes you better than other people. They thought that their prophecy and acts of charity sort of upgraded their status with God and with other people. And Paul's solution to the Corinthians' maturity is interesting to me. His solution wasn't just his letter, even though that's pivotal, and I'm super glad he wrote it, because <laughs> I get to read it, so do you. But listen to 1 Corinthians 4, or 1 Corinthians, yeah, 4, 16 through 17. He says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. At first, that sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? But it's not. Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 4, 17 that is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them in every, everywhere in every church. Did you catch that? The Apostle Paul is saying to them, I sent you Timothy so that you have a living letter, an example of what maturity looks like. And Timothy is a product of a relationship with me where I lived out maturity for him. And so he's showing us the exact pattern that Jesus had, right? Where a life lived impacts another life and it becomes a living example of all the truth that's there. And we know that because when Jesus came to earth, he had three years here to do his ministry, three years here to establish something that would persist beyond him and reach every nation on earth and every tongue. And he didn't establish a seminary, and he didn't set up an organization. He lived his life with 12 men, and three in particular out of those 12, where he exemplified and taught his truth. God's plan for reproducing maturity has always been people. It's people where we become examples of Christ. It's, it's said that truth is better caught than taught, and it's no different for maturity. It's moms in homes, it's dads in marriages, it's friends with each other and coworkers at work, it's classmates who are disciples of Jesus whose conviction has led them to obedience, and obedience has transformed them into loving people who are engaged in relationship as they have faithfully learned how to apply the word of God in their lives. And people look at that, and they see 
Jesus. They see his truth and they understand what it means. The series that we are in here at World Gospel right now on making disciples has a vision. And the vision is vastly greater than this generation and it's vastly broader than those who are sitting in this room this morning. Even our families or even the, the campuses that are in our city or even our town, even our counties or our state, the vision and potential impact of this kind of spiritual maturity and reproducing disciple-making ministry is global and it is eternal. And likewise, the potential loss is vastly greater than this generation and vastly broader than those sitting in this church. It is global and eternal. Our decision of whether or not to pursue growth and maturity will impact countless people who are bound and broken by sin across this world. That's why the work here at World Gospel Church is so very important to pursue with passion and clarity and intentionality. That's why breaking out of self-righteousness and selfishness and isolation and worldliness must happen. It is urgent that we press forward. It's one reason why we have things like a Go conference every year to enlarge our perspective and to expand our hearts to give us a vision for the lost and to be refreshed in why we need to be a light in the darkness. Given what we've heard this morning from God's word and its urgency and its necessity, God's calling us to press on to maturity by the power that his grace supplies in obedience to his word and in a way that makes it so that others can see the living reality of who Jesus is and what the word of God means. As a point of application this morning, I just want to ask you a question. As we've talked this morning about maturity and obedience to the Word of God, part of that is just taking yourself where you're at, not just saying, I wish I were there, but saying, where am I at now? And what is it in my life that I am committed to or engaged in that's keeping me from convicted obedience to Jesus? It might be a habit that you're caught up in, it might be an immoral relationship that you are engaged in. It could be sloth. It could be gluttony. It could just simply be spiritual neglect or maybe a grudge and a resentment that you're holding against someone. And these are the things that you're cherishing in your heart that are keeping you from that next step of obedience to Jesus and saying yes and surrendering to him. And so when we call the call for spiritual maturity and Jesus drives us toward it, that may be the thing today that you need to say, Jesus, I give this to you without strings attached and I will do exactly what you've called me to do by your grace. I'm gonna bow and give us a moment to pray and process that and for you to interact with the Lord and then I'll close us in a word of prayer. Let's bow together. Oh, Lord Jesus, we come before you as your people, as purchases of your blood by your grace. And Lord, our deepest desire, our longing is to be faithful to you. This morning, we bring you our lives without reservation. And we 
lay them before you. And we ask that by your grace and through your power, you would strengthen us and guide us to faithful obedience, to a life lived out of conviction for you. God, would you make us into those examples for our husbands and wives, for our children, for our friends and coworkers, and for this lost and dying world to see what it means to know and love Jesus and consequently to love others. We pray this in your powerful name, O Lord. Amen.